Hey, we are live. This is episode 105 of Bono's Health, and I'm honored to be joined by two of my favorite or, or people, role models, heroes, humans in the world. I got all my uh, swag from them. I've been to the San Francisco CrossFit gym, unfortunately, RIP um, to that. But uh, Kelly and Juliette Starrett, and then uh, becoming a Supple Leopard, you guys might know some of these things. Got the signature in there. Desk yes. Bound, which Juliette is credited on. Um, is that the, that's the only one of the many books that you are credited on? True fact. <laughs> and, uh, although I take, I do take credit for some of the other ones. You should take well, credit for them all. I was, I was <laughs> going to totally say, honest. Like, <laughs> and, and before, yeah, I was going to say, my wife's going to come on here, sex and relationship therapy. And, uh, she wanted to kind of like say, you know, how do we get down to the fact that Juliet is the brains behind the operation? I think you guys have admitted that many times on many different platforms that Kelly's just, you know, the, the pretty face in front of the camera, but. Juliet's a pretty face behind the camera that that makes it all go if that if we can go that far and then are but are you the new book is built to move that's coming out is that yes. are you on that one will you be credited yes there? yes in fact we're having this funny conversation right now about the title and the cover about whether it should be Kelly Star the the publisher thinks you should be Kelly Starrett and Juliet Starrett which is like a lot of Starrett on the cover <laughs> yeah. and Kelly and I kind of think it should be like Kelly and Juliet Starrett or Juliet right. and Kelly Starrett or something so so yeah I'm fully on the cover um right. not in not in one point <clears throat> font but let me um, let me say this so though. yeah I am so stoked to go out on the road so when we talked about we did a little book tour for deskbound it was so nice to have juliet there and now i literally am gonna be like oh i pulled a hamstring you better go on without <laughs> me and to have my wife as the face of the movement is really a relief frankly so yeah. too bad not it <laughs> you gotta do the nose touch is that that's the... right so i've already done that yeah so tell us a little about the book though built to move i and i heard you talking about it again on another show something about Focusing on the processes, is that is that accurate? More about the fact, and, and again, I know Kelly's talked about, uh, we all need a movement practice. If you just do Peloton, that is not a movement practice. It is incomplete. Um, so yeah, is that along the lines? Am I on the yeah, right give me path? The, give me the elevator yeah. pitch, Jay. Well, I mean, I think I'm going to change the question and answer, and answer it sort of this way, which is like, why this book? And I think the reason we wanted to write this particular book is it's sort of like the culmination of... Kelly and I being in the fitness business for 17 plus years um, in, in a variety of capacities. Obviously, we owned a commercial gym. We owned a physical therapy clinic. We've taught courses. Um, you know, we've been in and around um, human movement. Kelly has done a ton of consulting with teams at every every high level. So we figured out how to sort of take the best practices there and spin them back to, backwards towards people. So, you know, we've really had this very diverse exposure to the health and fitness community. And I think one of the challenges that we've had, and maybe it's because we're getting old now, is... Um, seeing that we feel like the health and fitness business is getting like a D minus in terms of, um, well, I wrote my name on the test. I'll get a D. Yeah. You get a D, D you get a D, D, D's <laughs> get degrees, D's get degrees. Um, in yeah. that, and what I mean by that, and Kelly and I've talked about this a lot, but we mean by that is that look like we've all, those of us who are in the vertical of, of people who describe ourselves as health and fitness enthusiasts, like we've gotten better, right? We're all tracking our heart rate variability and how many steps we take. And, you know, we, we track our, track our macros and our nutrition and we take the right supplements at the right time. And, you know, we have a breathing practice and we tape our mouth shuts at night, shut at night. And like, we're doing all this stuff. Um, maybe not all of us, everything, you know, every, you know, saunas and ice baths are huge, right? Like, but what we haven't done is figure out how to pass that message on to people who wouldn't describe themselves using the word athlete. And so I think that was kind of our answer and to, just to this. cut through so much confusion. I mean, in our neighborhood, our, if we just took it, our neighborhood as a cohort, we feel so many questions about, Hey, what do you think about keto or intermittent fasting? Mm. Or what about this exercise thing? And, and what the world doesn't need is a diet and exercise book at all. And it seems like the, the, if I, I'm, I'm going to swear for a moment. So just trigger warning. I feel like we're at peak internet fitness shittiness <laughs> where <laughs> I can't tell who's an expert what's yeah. working what's a gimmick how am i being just entertained it's really fitness is entertainment and when if we use covid as a test as a, as a crisis test we didn't do very well we came out more depressed with using more substance to try to self-soothe we were fatter we didn't move as much there's more orthopedic pain there's depression 
But if you look at any of the questions about, well, how are we doing? If, if fitness and, and performance, if that's supposed to transform society and transform our communities, do we have less pain? Are we, you know, are there fewer injuries? Are we having less surgery? And it looks like every single metric is trending in the wrong direction. We're getting a D. We're getting a D. <laughs> you're failing. Yeah, so, yeah, you're, yeah, hey, yeah. You, I see that yeah, you're yeah. eating food. And and I don't, it's not from lack of information. I think we're killing people with information, but it's, it's too much information we, and too complicated. Yeah. So we call it kind of like we want a rewilding. We want to get people to base camp before we start talking about what color rope you're going to take up Everest. I mean, that's what's, you know, <laughs> yeah. seems yeah. Like it's and, happening. And just to sort of circle this up, I think what we realize, and we really love this base camp concept, um, what we've realized is that um, and this is actually across all cohorts. So, so while we're talking to like the everyday person in this book, um, these are actually the same things that Kelly would tell, you know, SEAL Team Six if he was going to go work with SEAL Team Six. So it's important that people realize that like even the best aren't getting it right. Even the best are missing these like key parts of, um, you know, these what what Kelly and I call vital signs, these habits that we think everybody should have in their life and really basic ones. Um, in fact, often elite athletes do the worst at that because they get so focused on the the real elite stuff that they're not even doing the basics. So. I think this book was sort of our way of saying, hey, like, what are the habits and practices in our life and, it, you know, that, that we're telling people when we go out and coach or in our neighborhood or at our kids' basketball game, like, these are the basic things that you should be doing on a daily basis to feel good, to be able to move freely through your environment. And actually be worth a crap when yeah. you get older. Yeah, yeah, and be worth a crap when you get older. And we really are obsessed with this word durability. Um, we don't love longevity and resilience and some of the other words. We like durability because ultimately what that means to us is that, is that, you know, when you get to be 85 years old, you know, you can go on a hike with your grandkids or do whatever it is you want to be doing or when, when you, when you fall and break something at any age, right. you're, you're going to have some resilience to come back and yeah. man, be able to do that. Because, you know, you know, obviously, as you know, I'm a cancer survivor and, and I'm sort of the, you know, the poster child of like, it's not sort of if challenging things are going to happen to you from a health standpoint, it's more when, I mean, at least for like 25% of people. And so, you know, our goal is how do we, how do we take away some of the confusion from this chaos of the health and fitness business, give people some basic ideas of what we think the most important principles are around health, all sort of focus on movement and how can you fit those things into a busy yeah. life? Because that's really, yeah. let me just jump on that because the Juliet and I have two kids. We run our, we work for ourselves. We have all of the things that like, we don't have hours and hours to meditate and write in our gratitude journals and meal prep, but just like we are working parents. And when we come into these communities, we see people have these perfect plans that just fall apart. As soon as you have to run your kid to the school, as right. soon as you need to make a lunch, as soon as you have a sick child or, you know, as soon as you have a, a work deadline or have to take a red eye. So we're, we're really approaching it with that. Here's where you're going to put this in and not just one vertical. And the second aspect I think is really important is how all of these things interrelate and interconnect, how tightly coupled these behaviors are. Yes, walking is important, but when you walk, you load your tissues. That's super cool. But also you accumulate enough fatigue that you're going to sleep because you walk. And then that changes the whole host of behaviors on the other side. So that's what we're, I think is really novel about this. And it's not diet and exercise because the people who've read this book are like, wow, you know, I don't even exercise and I hate food. And this changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you guys, I think you guys are being generous with the D and I don't know if I'm too pessimistic, New Yorker versus Cali you, you're California. Mm, that maybe um, you're yeah, right. That could be it. That could be it. Um, so D is, is being generous. I mean, again, uh, you know, I'm sure y'all are familiar with a lot of the statistics of, only it was 89 percent of americans are considered metabolically unhealthy that recent study um based on only 80, it's only 89 though we can go all only the way. 89 yeah we <laughs> so i mean if you're if you're doing it on a mathematical grade that's uh below an f i think in terms of you know what we're doing so um yeah the question that i wanted to really ask you guys having you on here both of you um with your podcast where you're interviewing world-class performers again you know, you, you, you listed out some of the folks you work with. You didn't even mention the White House and going to see President Obama and things like that and all these other cool things. But, uh, you know, we're waiting for the movie that you're going to make. Right. The, the You're in Dune, too. Right, Kelly? Is that, <laughs> is that I am trying to gain weight to bulk up to be a sandworm. That's true. <laughs> 
Um, that would be that would be a peak. To, I mean, let me just too. say, like Kelly will have peaked as a human. You'll never see him again if that happens. Like that will be a peak. <laughs> Keeping my hand in the box every day. <laughs> there you go. So, um, but yeah, that's the question. Ultimately, is you guys are doing your part. You're being the change you want to see in the world. Uh, you've maybe evolved from. Again, we were talking about you when you were on Joe Rogan's podcast and uh, drinking bulletproof coffee. Um, are you still? You're not drink. You're not putting butter in the coffee and MCT oils anymore. Is that? that I, I think you went away from that. Yes. I think they were, uh, I discovered early on, um, and this I think really speaks to some of the confusion, right? We were, all of us were, became keto curious, like, oh, we need to be fat adapted. Oh, hey, I can use, you know, fat as a fuel, like early zone, early keto, right. Rob Wolf is our good friend. We're just, we're, we suddenly are like, oh, we're exposed to this. And so someone's like, hey, put this MCT oil and this butter in your coffee, and it's a great fuel source. And I was like, Hey guys, it gives me diarrhea every single yeah. time. So, um, that was when I just, dis- was the, the fun term. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. And I discovered then that these are the, the, you know, as we're coming to understand, for example, you know, that it's less, yes, you can use some of these diets to remedy health problems, but for wellness and performance, that's not the same you know, s- sustainability. And we've really f- made people fear things like bananas. We just heard the story yeah. where someone was telling us, uh, a g- amazing, brilliant coach who works with Tour de France level athletes. And she was saying that she went to her friend's house and the friend, her daughter asked for a banana. He's like, can I give your kid a half a banana? She's like, she actually needs the whole banana. And he's like, well, isn't that too much sugar? And she's like, are you serious? Like you're worried about getting my kid a banana. Like yeah. you need to just take that right down. Yeah. yeah the banana. I think the banana and our, our, um, you know, sort of nutrition guru, E.C. Sinkowski, I think has, um, she's done a great job of using the banana as like a metaphor for everything that is crazy about the health and fitness business. Um, you know, that man just, eats banana survives. Yeah, it's like, it's a sort of like such a great example about how we've lost our minds and lost the narrative about what's, what simple habits what are actually food? important, yeah. important for people. Yeah. And it's, it seems like, and I started, I had to, ended up starting a second podcast with a personal trainer buddy of mine back in New York city and we called the demand better podcast. And it is, to call out the craziness oh, so and the noise of like demand better from personal trainers. And what does that look like? Like they shouldn't be on their phone when they're taught, when they're working with you, you have that hour. Um, and again, just cause they're a 25 year old with six pack abs does not mean what they do is going to work for you. All these kind of things. Um, and yeah, 98% of the time we focus on the 2% of the, do I need agave syrup in my, in my <laughs> tea? And that's the thing that's going to again, change the world. Um, so yeah, I, the question I was starting to get to though, um, is, is there hope? Is and, and you guys are at the forefront of this, you know. I think again, if you, you guys are uh, either, whether both of you or one of you at least is is all, almost always on one of these top 100 greatest.com or or you know, whatever health influencers. So you guys are on that forefront, and so you're writing these books again, you're doing the part, but with all the scary statistics, this is the first generation of kids back in uh, yeah. 2010. The statistic came out that is uh, has a shorter life expectancy than the previous generation. The first time in human history that has ever happened. All these scary things. Um, is there hope other than <laughs> do we need more, you know, voices? Is it grassroots? Is it too little too late? Is it, you know, we're fighting big pharma? I don't know. It's, it's all very overwhelming. So uh, you guys being in the forefront, do you have hope? You have two kids. I have a new kid on the way. Uh, you know, my wife's pregnant. She might pop on here any minute. Um, she's waiting at the door. So she's going to come in and ask you guys a question too. You can come in, honey. Um, but yeah, is there hope? Let's, let's leave it on that. I, I want to say that I think our time, first of all, to reset the time frame and time calculations are different than we might expect in so much that the, my new motto and personal MO is <clears throat> the glacial pace is the breakneck pace. This mm. is how long it takes to disseminate information and make change. And we can't quite yet see this generation of kiddos behind us who are starting to be more turned this, on this and starting to make different decisions. Oh, it's so great. Yes. <laughs> so yes. great. I can't wait uh, to meet that child. And I would, that's one of my friends a long time ago said, I would pay money to be born into your family. And I was like, Oh, that's so nice. So let me pass that compliment on and pay money to be born in your family. But um, you know, we, I just saw this great uh, quote by Sir Francis Bacon, who is the father of the scientific method. Right. And he's like, Hey, look, you know, he's the guy who said, Real science is induction, pattern induction through large data sets. So you need to see lots and lots of information, try to understand what you're seeing. But someone just, he had this quote that said, you just don't know 
if your art is going to work or what your thing is doing is going to make any relevance for 75 to 100 years. You just don't, don't know. So the question we have is if we can't see the inputs and outputs of the behaviors we're making and how we're trying to transform our own communities and our own families, then we may best just continue to do the right thing and trust that if we continue to do the right thing and enough of us do the right thing, we will see the change that we're after, but it may take a, a generational scale to really kind of understand what's happened. Yeah. And, and I would just add that I think it's a super complex problem with no easy answer. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately I think we do live in a time where people you are get Peloton. hoping, yeah, like, you I get think Peloton. people are hoping for um, easy answers. Um, and I think, for most questions like this, the answer is it depends. But I mean, I would say I overall feel a sense of optimism. I think one thing that is interesting to see in the social media world is that um, Kelly and I have sort of watched our own evolution going from being way more aggro 10 years ago and all about performance and optimization. And, we're old. and and now I guess, I guess we're old, but I'm starting to see in the health and fitness space more and more voices like yours, um, people like E.C. Sinkowski, Bio Lane. I mean, there's a whole host of other voices now who I think have realize the same thing we've realized, which is like we've lost control of the narrative here in the health and fitness space. And we have not done a service to the greater community. And we really need to start to try to give basic helpful information that's actually doable for people. You know, like if you'd asked me 10 years ago what how people should work out of and like CrossFit, it's the only way functional fitness, ugh, whatever. And now I'm like my literally like if people ask me like what workout program they should do, I was like, you should do something that you like and that you will do. Like that's 100%. Like I, beyond that, I don't care if you do Zumba or F45 or CrossFit or Peloton or go hiking with your friends or literally whatever it is. Like the important thing is that you will do it and that maybe even it brings you some joy. Um, and that's where we've lost it. We've, you know, people feel like they should be doing all these things. And, and are we arguing about health? Like how strong does my 103 year old Chinese grandma? She's not very strong, right? 103. You know, how strong are children? Like, you don't necessarily have to be that strong. Does weightlifting important? Of course, of course, of course. So are we talking about health? Are we talking about performance, which is a different conversation still? Or are we talking about entertainment? Because we've seen f nutrition become identity. We've seen, you know, people are looking for relating and, you know, if we if the primary reason we have a brain and communication and speech is so we can have these really meaningful interpersonal re re interactions in our tight tribe where we spend hours and hours a day interacting, then people are going to look for some outlet because they're not getting that. And that means now suddenly it's entertainment. So the liver king is entertainment. And what the problem is, and it's great entertainment. It's a WWE character. I mean, my right. kids follow the liver king. But when we begin to confuse that for health. And there could be elements of truth in everything. Oh, you're eating a whole animal diet. That's super cool. You're eating whole foods. You exercise a lot. You're getting a lot of sun. That's super cool. But suddenly the average person who comes in, who is an expert in some areas of life is like, hey, oh, I need to turn my health around. And they get some like, oh, I just eat all this liver and, you know, and <laughs> that's going to do it. And it, and that's the conversation. I think it starts to get muddy. Is this yeah. about performance? Is this is just about basic line health or is this about entertainment? I got one more thing to add to just on the optimism thing. I think people who are listening to this and in this space should really sort of take uh take on the role of being like a node in their community that's what kelly and i try to yeah. do like i think we really are kind of a node of um sort of like disseminating health and fitness information and you know we always have people over to our house and we're having people work out and jump in our ice bath and sauna and we're spreading whatever information we have and we're trying to debunk new health and nutrition myths and tamping down fires tamping down fires like we're trying to be that node in a community and and we're talking about a community of normal people like living their lives with normal jobs we're not talking about being a node to other health and fitness people we're like right. trying to be a node and i think that's where that real change and where the hope comes yeah. from is is it's not going to come top down from all the people on the internet with abs that no one can relate to <laughs> it's going to come from people like you guys and Colorado and us in California and in like, you know, small places and communities trying to say, hey, we've totally overcomplicated this health and fitness thing. There are a multitude of ways to be healthy. You can have a tons of different body types and still be healthy. Um, you can experience joy in life and still be healthy. I mean, there's all these things. Um, so I think that's where we really have to change as a community is 
We need to just make it simple and we need to be a node of reasonableness for people around us. So to summarize, every human should be able to deadlift 1.75x their body weight. <laughs> I mean, For, if you can't, you're definitely going to die young. Uh, on an etot, which is <laughs> our version of the EMOM. It's every 30 seconds on the 30 seconds. So go. we're just, we yeah. just trademarked just, yeah. etot. Etot. So you're welcome. And, and soon, you, as you have children, you'll have the e tater tots. It's going to be great. <laughs> And I know Kelly has to go a little bit closer to the top of the hour, but Julia, you're going to stay on here until we solve this whole world health crisis. Perfect. I'm here. I'm ready. Um, so we're going to keep you hostage here. But no, I do have my lovely wife who is Hi. a little pregnant. She's half, Congratulations. Pregnant. Thank Congratulations. You. Sorry I'm late. I think Bo told you um, baby needed to eat. So uh, <laughs> I had to get some food in my belly. We get it. But, we yeah. get it. <laughs> I actually don't get it. I'm like, what's going on? Well, you don't get the pregnancy part, maybe, but I'm sure you get the food part. <laughs> I used to say to my wife, um, you know, babe, there's just too many women trapped in one body right now. Yeah, it is. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of people in a single body there at some point. <laughs> and if you meet my daughters, you're like, oh yeah, that was a lot of lot of star oh, in a single. A lot body. of human in one body. I'd love to meet them one day. Too many stars <laughs> in the nebula. The nebulas. <laughs> well, you guys should finish like more, talking more about health and fitness because i don't want to digress i think i think much. we'll, no, we'll come, come on back digress to it. digress so digress you're, you're this is bert bo and i've been talking I, about this i understand we're going to talk about vaginas I mean, which is one of my favorite subjects Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yes but you know I, I, it, as one of the things that you are hopefully we're going to slide into in discussion no is intended. that's right <laughs> but um uh, different word um <clears throat> we're gonna uh talk about um hey, is that's what she said people don't know how to self-soothe and interact and problem solve in their own and we we i mean just two days ago juliet's like hey you all need an accountant because it's a neutral third party you need to solve this money problem and it seems that we're having an interrelational problem as much like it's it's like the things that made us human you know, from not like, hey, we're going to eat paleo nests, you know, hornet's nest soup. But the very foundational practices are being watered down. And it puts a lot of strain on people where we're feeling really isolated and cut apart and, and don't know how to be intimate or have meaningful relationships. Yeah. And I'll say that years ago, I went to some presentation where a guy put up a slide that had a lot of impact on me because it was basically like, what are the factors that help you live a long life? And mm -hmm. like far and away above any health metric metric was loving yeah, right. relationships and mm -hmm. community around you. Like those things, like literally it was like those far outweighed. Plus anything. butter in your coffee. Yeah. I mean like, yes. And so, so that's always had Apple a big impact vinegar. on me where I'm like, I'm like, oh, okay. You want to have like healthy, Dummies. loving relationships. And then, and then the other things are like a bonus. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not a lot of pay, people pay attention to that or pay enough attention to the, the quality of their relationships, even though we know that that's one of the biggest determinants of health and longevity. And just generally it's one of the biggest parts of your life. So Yeah. And we alluded to the the whole COVID thing, and I think a study that I saw come out of that was um, of every day of loneliness, true loneliness, physiologically was worse than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Like just the negative mm. physiological yeah. effects. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and that well, isolation. you know, everybody's um, you know all jacked up and excited about the blue zones where people live forever. Mm -hmm. um, Olive and, oil and everything. Yeah, and I, you know, um, I, I haven't spent as much time looking into it, but what I do know is community and mm -hmm. connection yeah. are huge in those, in those yeah. places. And so it would be interesting to know, you know, is it their specific health practices or is it community and connection? Like what actually is it that is making those zones blue zones, but community and connection has got to be a big part I of it. We're just in Europe teaching and um, we went uh, we were in Munich and we always love going to the beer gardens, beer garden. <laughs> and one of the things that we notice is we walk through a thousand people sitting down eating chickens and salads and, you know, like fresh and beer bread and, and beer and, and yeah. beer. Like that's, I do have a German keg. style. I do have a German style ale. Kolsch. Noted. There we go. I, I don't know if Kolsch is German, but it could be. And uh, sounds German. At least. <laughs> sounds German. And uh, not a single phone is out. There's not even a phone on the table. Like, so what's going I'm like, what's going on? These people are on Instagram right now. Like they could be, <laughs> they could be live tweeting this beer yeah. and they're, they're live tweeting. That's how old I am. Yeah. Um, you, are. <laughs> you, uh, 
so you know you i think there is really something you know one of the things you talked about early on the in sort of the setup was that how did Juliet and i work together and we for example don't pick up new sports without the other person mm. and we do a lot of sports together so we we spend our recreational time together whether that's biking or training or hiking or paddling um we really make conscious decisions to make sure that we are doing things that aren't like folding laundry and you know mechanics because i can do all of the business stuff with our staff anytime i want <laughs> You're not staff, baby. You're more than staff. <laughs> I'm your boss, baby. I'm your boss. <laughs> boss baby. CEO. CEO. Not much above that. And it's boss, comma, Wait, baby, not you're, boss, baby. Boss, you're, baby. You're saying you kind of enjoy each other's company? Is that? Yeah, you know? I mean, it does help. And I realize this is not the case for everybody. But I mean, we actually do really like each other and can totally bro out until the end of time. And don't get we don't get tired of each other, Um, thankfully, because, I mean, we do this is a unique arrangement where we work together and then we also do a lot of recreational activities together so i realize that wouldn't work for every relationship and i realize you know definitely there are some people who would need much more like alone time and yeah. um you know their their time to do their own thing but what works for us is that you know we really do make sure that we have things outside of work that we do together and and not very many things that we don't do together. You know, I always struggle to understand, like, how do people make it in a marriage when one partner is into golf and the other one right. isn't? And so one partner's gone all weekend golfing eight hours a day. Like, again, no judgment on golf. It's a great sport. But I'm always like, how does that work for relationships? Right. And again, many ways to do it um, that work for different people. But that wouldn't work for us. Yeah. So I, I think you're touching on two important pieces. One is figuring out what works for you as opposed to just comparing yourself to others and, you know, having just one general rule that we think fits everyone, which doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is um, uh, pregnancy brain. Hold on. <laughs> I need to remember the second point, but let's talk about this first point first. <laughs> one of the things that Juliet and I have found is that we, we try to create a structure where we don't have to talk about talking about it. Right. So on one hand, we are, you know, 7 a.m. this morning, a little bit before 7, Juliet pops out of bed and she turns on the Tour de France and she hands me a coffee and she's like, you know, Pitcock is leading up the Alpes Like, you need to get out here. And uh, I'm like, wow, like my wife and I are aligned in the things we nerd out about. So there's that piece. But the second piece is we're very meta about that. So on the one hand, we're very unconscious. We just need to be together and not talk about relationships. We're just going to sauna or ice bath. Like we're going to go for a hike. We don't have to talk about our relationship 24 seven. I feel like that's a red flag for me. If I had to discuss my feelings about the coffee that you made me 24 seven, I would be exhausted and I would have this relationship. But simultaneously, we do often, most weeks have a feelings meeting where we sit down and we're very conscientious about how that works, where we're talking about a relationship and you know, our family. And so we, we occupy both those sides. And then I think it's not so magical. It's just rinse, wash, repeat for a few decades. Yeah. And we're coming up next year. We've been married for 20 years. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. So far. As so you far. Were talking, I remembered the second point because that's how my brain works, which is that you guys are intentional about what you do together and the time that you spend together. And I think that's a really, really important um, point that like a lot of couples miss, which is, you know, taking, the time together for granted as opposed to being intentional about, okay, we're going to do these things together. We're going to spend this much time together or not together. Um, but there's that intentionality behind it, which relates to health and fitness, right? Like, you know, being intentional about your choices um, and investing in what's important to you. So I think, yeah, just like the inten intentionality and figuring out what works for you um, as a couple, as opposed to, you know, going with whatever is working for everyone else or whatever fad diet is happening right now. Or can whatever, I, can you know. I, can I do start confessions right now? <laughs> right, confessions. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is, this is the hottest night I can think of. Our kids are all sorted out because they're teenagers. Jill and I have taken a quick hot tub. We turn the lights down. We do some magnesium. <laughs> we take, and then we go to bed in the nines. Yeah. <laughs> like, Sounds like I'm like that's too. so <laughs> hot. Like I like oh my You're god. You're already looking forward to it, aren't you? <laughs> hey, you want to do some magnesium and go to bed at 9 15? <laughs> Not what every couple envisions as the secret to a happy marriage, right? Like, yeah. Um, so that brings me to one of my questions, which is um, you know, most couples struggle with keeping that spark alive. And 
I'm sure just like every other couple, you've been through ups and downs where some periods maybe you're kind of bored, there's routine or, you know, maybe not feeling as excited in the relationship. Maybe not. I'm making an assumption here, but most couples go through different phases and stages in their That's relationship. It's what keeps her employed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, what has worked for you? Um, in terms of, again, the spark might not be the same as it was in Other the beginning. Other than doing magnesium. Other than yeah, doing, doing magnesium. magnesium. <laughs> well, uh, I'll, start and I'll start with this and then let Kelly take it. I mean, I think a big part of this is being able to change your expectation with a relationship. Um, because I think if you go in, like you guys are about to have a kid. And if you think that your sex life is going to be the same after you have a kid as before you have a kid, then you will be disappointed and you've set yourself up for disappointment. And hang on a second. Let me just, um, let me just frame that for the listeners. Yeah. Just stay up for three days and then tell me how sexy you feel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, so, and, and then I think you also go through these different phases of your life. And, and I think, I, I mean, I, I would actually counter what you're saying. Like, I cannot see a marriage of any length or quality where your sex life isn't an up and down. Like, yeah. I believe that's not possible. I, I believe there's no one who's married for a long period of time that doesn't have periods where they're kind of like, meh, whatever. And then periods where they're more excited. Like, I can't see that. So for me, I think that helps me because that's my expectation. I don't always expect to be like, oh my God, I feel so sexy and Kelly's so hot. And this is all. like, I don't expect to have that. So I'm not disappointed. Like, I'll just start by saying that I don't expect to have that. I'm disappointed. I think this, this comment, I'll make maybe more for men than women like dude let go of spontaneity like let go of that as a dream and a fantasy all men on the earth after you have children like stop it like you know because otherwise you're literally just going to be disappointed as a man for the rest of your freaking natural life like like unfortunately when you have kids and the crazier life gets and your privacy gets more and more and more limited like you may need to actually be like dude we need to meet up at four o'clock and have sex and yeah. that may not be the hottest thing you ever did in your life but but i'm just saying like the the opportunities as your as kids come into your life for spontaneity start to get real small and i think if more men than women are expecting that spontaneity to be there. And that's how they measure like whether there's a spark or not, like dis get ready for men, like a lifetime of sexual disappointment. Cause it's not reality. And, and let me, let me jump in and, and temper that just for a second. <laughs> Cause my horn, Cause dog, I'm the mean my lady. I'm the mean wife lady. is only talking about sex, but there is Man's so it to us. Kelly. There Man's is so yeah. much. Let me tell you what mansplaining really is. This is what <laughs> Kelly's latest thing is, is he likes to explain what mansplaining is. It's our favorite <laughs> family joke. <laughs> um, it's very meta meta explaining <laughs> if you can re expand your definition of intimacy mm -hmm. to touch and hugging and and massage and yeah. it is that wildly you know what you're trying to do is keep the connections <laughs> not creepy nice. keep the connections all firing and letting your partner know that like you're thinking about them and you're close then when like you may have to have sex at 7 a.m and because either that or you're just gonna you know be a celibate priest in a partnership which a lot of people do so what i think you're doing is you're thinking about the longest warm-up ever if you're going to be thinking that way and, and it's called natural periodization. If we're just bringing it back to the strength and conditioning, yeah, just, we just, we just it. remodeled our bathroom, our yeah. kid's bathroom. And we had everyone in our house, in our bedroom, using to, the bathroom, using the bathroom, which is, so let's super just say there was awesome. an ebb. Let's say there was an ebb <laughs> because we had literally no privacy because our not kids go to bed after us. No, not, no, at, not night. at night. Right. And so when your daughter's boyfriend is like, excuse me, sorry, you know, I have to drop a deuce in this bathroom. You're like, <laughs> You know, you're like, all right, well, you know, the, the mood is a little different. I think we're going to have to. Just... I, do, I do have to do a call back to, you know, Kelly fandom here is could he lift the 200 pound stone you referenced in the Joe Rogan? Podcast? He, yes, did. He, he did. did. He did. He did. Yes. He's still doing that and he still did. It. OK. And and you should know that he is. A, it was an engineer kid. They're, they're separated now because he's going to college. And they just this like happened this week. But uh, we told him about the G stone. And the next day, because he started training with Georgia, we he was kind of lifting curious. He's a big, strong kid. And then, you know, our family. And then he started lifting more, and they started deadlifting together. And then all of a sudden, Georgia told him about the stone, and then the stone was in the training yard. And then, like, the next day, there were a lot of attempts for him to shoulder the stone. Yeah. And then he did. And then I was like, well, that's good, but can you do the 405? Because all men should be able to do the 405. And within a week, there was 405 on the bar. Wow. Did it, did it go up, though? 
Oh yeah. It was on the bar, but yeah. <laughs> so I have a question. I mean, you're a marriage and sex therapist. How'd, how'd we do? How was our answer? Perfect. <laughs> Be better than the uh, health score of the country, as we earlier Honestly, agreed. Like, it's really refreshing to hear that because these are some of the things that I kind of quote unquote preach to my clients is A, things are constantly changing. We evolve, we change in relationships as individuals, as a couple, we go through different stages, phases. It's unrealistic to expect, you know, the, the, the passion, the excitement in a relationship to stay consistent and or be similar or, you know, even the same intensity as like the beginning of a relationship, right? It ebbs and flows. Um, so having that expectation and being able to adapt to the changes, I think, is what makes it um, easier to deal with is, like, you know, that adaptability, basically. Um, and uh, what, you know, Kelly was talking about in terms of redefining sex and intimacy, that sex isn't just intercourse. And that's what everyone focuses on. But if we're able to broaden our definition and, uh, you know, see intimacy and, and sex and sexuality as so much more than just that, it doesn't have to be intercourse. You know, if you're able to touch in a sensual way or look into each other's eyes in a very deep, meaningful way, that can be exciting for some people, be vulnerable emotionally in a relationship. Um, so, yeah, just kind of redefining intimacy and what you said julia like you know just kind of adapting to the natural changes and evolution of life and, I feel, and I feel like there are a couple of things that have i mean i'm approaching 50 and my wife is has six pack abs and she's jacked and uh so that helps thanks for that um that, <laughs> <laughs> you know You've gotten better looking. I have gotten fatter and bolder. So that's not true. You I'm look so also good in those jean shorts, baby. I'm super jean stoked shorts. that I have and someone the khaki who's still tight pants in the in the carnival, whatever that is. Yeah, yep. that's right. That's right. I'm also super stoked that uh, at this point in my life, like someone finds me attractive. Like that's super cool. That is that is like I can't I can't talk about that enough. That that you know approaching fifty, and then I, I just want to also redefine sexist because. I think, you know, what you're thinking of is remember that the electrical like cocaine rush you had when you were 16. Yeah, that's not yeah. like you, you actually couldn't your your face would explode like you couldn't. It's like you'd tear a hammy. And uh, and what's amazing is the longer I'm uh, married to Juliet, I, I would say I, the safer and the more vulnerable and the more connected. I feel like actually I feel like the intimacy becomes more evolved. And uh, anyway, I just that and and I've been saying this for a long time now. So just bear with me. You know, what's super hot 401k. Ooh. You know, it's super sexy health insurance. New, no student loan. Wait, Roth, debt, no Roth car or traditional payment. or what? Where we Dude, <laughs> I, I am like Juliet has a mortgage. I'm like, oh, it's so hot. <laughs> and uh, she doesn't sleep on a futon. She doesn't have like an old car that she inherited from a friend. Like there's a whole lot of stability and sexiness there. Yeah. And Juliet and I are now to a place where we're starting to imagine what happens when our kids go to school. Like we have one daughter who's a senior, one's gonna be a freshman. In two seconds, like we fantasize and text back and forth sexy pictures of vans <laughs> and all the places we're gonna go and all the little cabins we're gonna be in. And honestly, that sort of role, let's call it role playing, gives us an opportunity yeah. to imagine our lives together in the future, not just what we need to, who's going to fold laundry and what are the problems. Mm -hmm. And so we do a lot of fantasizing together about what our life is going to be like in the future. And I'm telling you, that is part of it. Like we oh, talk yeah. about where we're going, what we're doing. Having something to look forward to, to be excited uh, about together. Yeah. I'm excited about your 401k. So hot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there's, there's two things I'll add to this, which are much less sexy than Kelly, but you know, I'm now in my late fifties and have a lot of friends in their late fifties and, um, yo, all men, women in their late fifties are either going through or, or perimenopausal. Um, and the thing that most of the women I know report is when they're having sex, they enjoy it. But if it wasn't like, dropped in their lap, it literally would never occur to their brain. Like the idea of doing it, thinking of like, there's a point at which for a lot of women, and I think it's, it's a short period of your life when you're going through menopause, but like, it's a real thing where like men need to be aware, like, Hey, yeah. my wife will enjoy this, but like, it might not actually occur to her that it's like a thing to do. And that might need to be on me for like a few years of this marriage to be the one that says, Hey, like it's time now. Um, because yeah. that's a really common thing about amongst women my age that are talking about, they're like, yeah, it's great when I'm doing it, but I would never think about it outside of the moment. 
Um, sure. So I think there's, sure. a, I think that just goes back to this sort of phase thing where everybody needs to be adaptable. And there may be a phase where like one person needs to be more the initiator and it's not going to be equal. And, and then there's a phase where someone else is. And, you know, I just think it's all about the adaptation and yeah. flexibility to like where you are in your life. So Bo, yeah. to your point, how do we work together? We like each other first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, if you're going to work with your spouse, we went to a physio conference where it was just, you know, it's uh, Danny Mate, you know, his physio group um, where they're bringing young physios in who are moving out of kind of traditional practice, starting their own practices. And just as sort of it, it kind of fell into our laps, like, hey, would you guys do a little talk about, you know, a little half hour speed sessions about working together? And we had 50 people and then the same 50 people stoned for the second thing. And then everyone went to their thing and came and we just went over and over. And I think we saved marriages. We saved businesses, <laughs> you know, because really, truly, it's remarkable to solve problems with your spouse but uh, and work together. But you better have some some foundational pieces there. Absolutely. But even if you do, I don't think it works for every couple. I mean, we sure. work together for a little bit on some projects and he wants to work together more than I do because <laughs> I feel like as much as we love each other and like each other, I don't know, there are certain dynamics that just maybe trigger us in those moments. And so, yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to work for everyone, but cool. I totally understand that. Yeah, it has to be foundation for sure. I mean, that might change in the future. Maybe in the future we'll be able to work together more. I don't know. I well, think I just, I, I just, so. I respect her more than she respects me. <laughs> well, you know, there's something, there's something that's impending coming, and we'll see how. I mean, you're working together. You know, sometimes people say, "How do you guys work together?" And Jill and I are like, "Aren't you in a marriage? Like, yeah, aren't you in a I mean, partnership? Like, yeah. You already work together." So, I mean, yeah. we're just expanding that definition. How, and but how do you make it work? Not just you know. And right. wait until you have. How do you enjoy kid. your job? Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of our friends, Laird Hamilton, has this uh, saying. He says to men, um, he's like, you're not confirmed as a man until you have a baby. And mm -hmm. and let me just define that for people. He's not saying you absolutely have to have a baby in order to be a man. But he's saying it's really difficult to be an extraordinary man and have a child. And that a lot of people can do one or the other. And he's, But when you can do both, when you can care for your family and show up and be vulnerable and be a member of your community and take care of your spouse and have your day job where you're super rad and fun, he's like, then we're like, wow, that kid's got something going on. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's really cool. It's, it's a really interesting test, but man, you be prepared. It's really, there's an opportunity for a lot of conversation coming. Yeah. You know, I think maybe the thing that might've impacted people the most at this PT conference, when we were talking about our relationship, because one of the things that um, they talk about in the PT conference, and, and I fully support this as a business owner is that, you know, people need to make their first hire when they're running a small business. And, and their recommendation of a first hire is you hire an assistant, like an executive right. assistant, whether that's a virtual one or in person or whatever, you know, just to kind of take the load off for these small physical therapy clinics. And that's a great piece of advice. But I was like, I'm going to cut through that for all of you people who are running physical therapy clinics Amen. together. I was like, your first hire needs to be a housekeeper mm. because, and, and I mean, I'm literally like for anyone who has the means in a marriage, whether you work together or don't work together, um, especially if both part, both people are working, like get a housekeeper yeah. because man, the amount of like challenge and conflict that comes up over stupid shit like who did and didn't clean out the toilet and <laughs> yeah. whatever is like a lot of that like those conversations can just be eliminated by getting a housekeeper so it was funny because all these people were here to get this business advice so i was like yeah yeah i mean hire an assistant that's great and everything but like if you want your marriage to work along with your business like get a housekeeper mm, yesterday yeah. yesterday um yeah. i know i want to be respectful of kelly's time he said uh, he had a previous commitment he has to go be a node in the community. No, he's got like five minutes. Give him, so hit him with your best ones. Five more minutes. And then, I mean, well, I'm happy if you're Juliet, if you have time, you want to yeah, wait yeah. for him. You're just, you're just, uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to have every minute of you we can get. Um, what I was going to say though, it sounds like we have a sequel to born, to, uh, born to move is born to maybe expletive word there. Um, and, and you guys can co-write that. It sounds like, mm. um, Juliet and Maha, Ideas but I don't know. I don't know. Mind. It sounds like that is because <laughs> along the lines of, and is that something I, I assume it's not along any of these topics we just talked about, uh, in the born to move book, unless it is, which I'm excited about. No, we, we haven't talked about these things in built to move at all just because 
you know, at some point you're like, okay, we have to just have some boundaries here. Cause you know, where, where are people? And the, and the real question is where are people learning how to be a human being? Where, where do they learn that? So maybe you have some really incredible parents, like you're it's born into TikTok. your family. <laughs> well, in 15 seconds, it's difficult. Yeah. And simultaneously, at least TikTok is talking about kids and mental health. And like, there's a whole bunch of positive potential. But what you realize is if you're learning to talk about your feelings from TikTok, your community has holes in it and you have a, a problem relating and you hadn't have coaches and mentors and teachers who are like, whoa, 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 this is what it means to be a, a meaningful person. And I think we can't uh, a meaningful having a meaningful relationship in your community, which I think a lot of people are struggling for, you know? And so, I mean, I think that's the, really the, the siren is that, you know, where are people learning how to be good partners, you know? And, you know, for Juliet and I, who are both children of divorce, you know, we made it, we were like, dude, wouldn't it be great if we just didn't do that? And we just <laughs> ended, a, you know, generations of dysfunction around divorce. If we could just stop that trauma. And uh, that was just an easy thing to, <laughs> to like goal. Step one, let's just stay married. Cool. Cool. Let's work on it every day. You know? Yeah. That commitment and, and investment. Um, yeah. And that decision, again, going back to the intentionality, I think there's, you guys have clearly made a lot of conscious choices and decisions in your life that have led you to where you are today, whether it's relationship wise. And, and I would, you know, I would just like to add too, though, and I am a huge believer in the intentionality and the planning and all that stuff. But I will say there is a large element of luck here too. You know, when we're all in our twenties or whenever we're seeking out our partners, like, man, we don't know. And it is a bit of a crapshoot because we all change so much. Um, I fell in love with Juliet in Chile at the world championships. We we're both competing. Like, yeah. talk about we were a total totally different. representative, <laughs> representative sample of what our lives could be together. Yeah. So, I mean, I do. You know, I will say, like, you know, I think part of it is just plain luck. Like, part of it is that we lucked out to find each other, and that we're so compatible, and that we like to bro out so hard together. Like, that is that. You know, there's a lot of intentionality, and there's a lot of thinking about how to, you know, make it last and make sure that we're still connected and intimate and all those things but also like men we just like also hit the jackpot of luck yeah absolutely yeah i mean a lot of people out there are trying their best and yeah. doing what they can yeah, yeah yeah sometimes yeah separation is better for them right it is yeah. i don't know i spot i was able to spot talent i was like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from a from marital a talent marital talent i was like Ooh. that girl you know i was actually taught i was a kayak rep and um I just kind of into the national team and I was talking to Juliet and I'm like, what do you do? She's like, I'm an internet professional in San Francisco. And I was like, I don't know what that means. I sleep in my truck. Like I, what? And she's like, I'm going to law school. And I was like, Oh, all right. All right. You know, there's, there's, you know, I, I recognize, you know, what I needed. I was that plant who needed the water. And I, I, I did see a lot of talent. Thanks Jay. <laughs> I saw, I saw, I saw financial stability and security while, yeah. while you were simultaneously <laughs> hucking down the class five. It was great. <laughs> My and my, my first instinct was that uh, I took a bad swim on a really gnarly class five section, and Juliet did save me. She actually pulled me into the raft. Oh wow! So, what I remember was saved you, babe. <laughs> the first time, baby. <laughs> well, what I remember was yeah. my five hundred dollar paddles and our uh, the friends. Uh, they first rescued those, and then Juliet. I was came out of just a really bad beating on the river, in a really scary place. And I just saw Juliet reach down and say, come with me if you want to live. And I was like, oh, that, sounds good. that may be folklore at this point, but it's a great, it's a great line. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one and only time we went whitewater rafting, oh. I think it was like a class one, two. two I don't, maybe. Yeah, I don't know how they get, difficult. there was a little bit of white water. Is that how it gets <laughs> yeah. uh, graded? So yeah, she did fall out and nearly again, her folklore, she nearly died. No, it's just scary <laughs> being so like, not in control of where you're going. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. None. No like, control. Yeah. Scary. So I'm yeah. like, I'm not doing that again. No. Well, that was really the allegory from my whole life until now is that I'm swimming class five and Juliet paddles up and is like, hey, bro, you can do better than that. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jay. I love you, Ben. I got you. I'll stick around. <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> hey, crew, I, I got to jump off. Yes. Thank you yeah. so much. It's so great to see you. Can't wait to visit you in Boulder. And uh, don't tell yeah. too many lies, Juliet. I'll try not to. <laughs> we'll just talk about how awesome you are. Yes. Thank you, Kelly. All right, guys. It's just Juliet. So now we can get <laughs> just, down me, and dirty. <laughs> just me. Just <laughs> me. We can we can start this uh, built to blank. 
built to <laughs> there's a lot of built to blanks you can do yeah 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 but it's the like you know we have the zen as fuck you can grab right there that's okay zen as fuck you can yeah. have the <laughs> there's uh was it the subtle art of not giving a blank yep. that became a national that's bestseller. a big book yep so that's it just got to throw that in there people are like what is this what is Catches this people's eyes it just needs a curse word in there Catchy yeah. word, exactly. Yeah. So, what what is what is the plan for the future of the ready state? So, I just for anyone who's not listening and not familiar with you guys, which seems unlikely, but um, you took. So, we're not even going to talk about the the warehouse of dreams, sadness there. That um, R.I.P. <laughs> R.I.P. R.I.P. Oh. And um, but you do have the virtual mobility coach. Uh, Want to make sure we shout that out, um, which is as you joke around, Kelly in your pocket. Um, you know, you're like, I got a little hip stuff going on. Okay. Try X, Y, Z, um, which is something, uh, and again, I would, uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get them on another time, but I wanted to definitely geek out on that. Cause that's something I've wanted to do. I haven't had the resources or the time and all that. I'm sure you guys invested a lot to get that up on running. Um, you can probably talk about all the headaches involved in that if you really want, but <laughs> she's just nodding along thinking of all the, the terrible. Yeah, it, it is funny. One of the, my pet peeves is um, every so often we get sort of like customer feedback, either they cancel or they write a review or whatever. And they're like, I mean, it's great, but it's just so expensive. And we charge $14.99 a month. And I mean, literally if one person could have like a behind the scenes view of like the human, yeah. uh, the human capital and the financial <laughs> yeah. capital and the amount of just sheer work it takes to like get a really good app launched in the app store. Like people mm -hmm. have no idea, right? They're like, I'm going to download this app and that app. And it's like, I, I can't look at apps with that view at all or, or any <laughs> sort of website content. Like I can sort of see, I'm like, oh my God, this must have taken years to build this, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. Especially one that actually like looks good and works well and is responsive. Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, I mean, yeah. as far as the, just to answer your actual question though, I mean, as far as the ready state, um, you know, we're, st we're continuing to just be a small but mighty business trying to grow and, um, but like grow on a micro scale, you know, we, um, we're just a fully bootstrap family owned business. So we, we have, we aren't in like the venture capital, raise money, grow exponentially game. Um, I mean, really our goal is just to try to serve more people. We really do feel like, um, and, and, you know, I know a lot of people say this in business and it's kind of cliche, but I mean, we really did start this business because we felt like a lot of people didn't understand how their bodies work and, and worked and had no tools to be able to fix themselves. And on top of that, waste a ton of money going to, you know, medical doctors and physical therapists and functional health doctors and, you know, and, and a lot of the pain and suffering and performance mm -hmm. loss that people experience are things they could literally fix on their living room floor right. while they're Netflixing at night. Um, and so I think that's really the word we're trying to spread out is like, is, and this is also a big part of built to move is that, um, you don't need to add in, you know, 10 hours of yoga a week or some complicated yoga practice, but you do actually need to put some input back into your body, especially for those people who are doing anything athletic. And I'm talking like from hiking all the way to high level crossfitting, like, you know, and, and people will learn that lesson. I mean, to the young people listening to this, if you're in your twenties and you put no input into your body, but you're using your body for literally any purpose, like just wait until you're in your forties, like yeah. you'll come a knocking at the door. Um, <laughs> Um, because everybody who's using their body has experiences some trouble. So, you know, our big challenge as a company, and this has been since the beginning, is how do we get people to care before they get injured? And mm -hmm. it's a challenge and frustration for us. You know, most people find us, um, you know, who aren't part of the CrossFit community or, you know, some of our kind of like super user fan base. Um, most people find us first because they're in pain. Um and, they, and that, whether that's kind of chronic nagging pain and injury or a catastrophic injury or a surgery or something, that's how most people find us. Um, and we're always trying to figure out strategies of like, how do we capture people's attention to care before they get to that point where they're, you know, dealing with a lagging indicator, which is an injury or pain or whatever. So, I mean, that may be a problem that, and not maybe, I know it's going to be a problem we're trying to solve as long as the ready state is in existence. But that's one of our biggest challenges is, how do we get the message? And we're trying to do that and build to move. I mean, you know, one of our, um, you know, if we're going to use the, again, cliche terms of like the pillars of health that people <laughs> talk about, like sleep and nutrition and community and all those things. One of the things that we think is a pillar of health is actually putting some input back into your body in terms of, you know, 
um, mobilization, stretching, self-care, um, you know, practicing basic things. Like one of the chapters in our book built to move is about the ability to get up and down off the ground and how mm. important that is. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to kind of spread the good word that like, you know, like you've got to do a little input into the system and it does not need to be hours and hours and hours of Edo Portal or yoga practice or whatever, that there are some really basic things you can do to make yourself feel better. Um, and speaking of being a node, like one of the things I feel the most pride in is, is like, you know, our daughter Caroline's kind of a high level water polo goalie. And, you know, Kelly's taught her one of these mobilizations he does. I don't know if you guys have ever had him do it or done it where it's like someone kind of puts their, almost their foot on your shoulder mm -hmm. and is working on your internal mm -hmm. rotation. And so Kelly has taught that to Caroline because water polo is a really shoulder heavy sport. And then she had a friend at water polo who was having some shoulder pain. And so Caroline did that mobilization mm -hmm. to the kid. And then Caroline came home last night and she said she showed up at practice and the kid that she had taught was doing it to another <laughs> kid who had also complained of shoulder pain. Right. So that's like that node concept, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. it's sort of this, like, how do we get, how do we sort of spread the word? And it's hard because, you know, most of us are busy and we're like, I'm just going to smash myself for an hour yeah. and then fall asleep. So I think that's the biggest business challenge. Um, you know, we continue to just try to grow on a micro level and figure out how we can always be iterating on our products and services so that they're, you know, the most intuitive and useful for people, um, which is hard. I mean, you know, the other big challenge is, man, we talked about this at the beginning. The fitness space is busy. And mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I'm in this space and I have like 10 or 12 like fitness apps on my phone and some of them I use and some of them I don't use. And, and so I think it's, um, it's, you know, we're competing in a very busy space with a lot of people and many of whom are doing good things. Um, so, you know, it's, it's challenging, yeah. but we're having a great time. And, <laughs> um, you know, Kelly and I love working together. We have a really small team of awesome humans. Um, and, and I think that's really everything. Like now, you know, I've been a lawyer. I've had a lot of trippy jobs in my life. And in the end, in my advanced age, you know, it often matters less what you're doing that, and more that you're doing it with people that you mm -hmm. enjoy being around. And man, we, we struck gold in terms of the team we have around us. And, you know, like we would all want to like hang out and we do a lot of us hang out outside of the office as sad as that is. <laughs> That's awesome though. You have a yeah. great team. It's your tribe. Yeah. You got your tribe. Your tribe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I said, uh, I think I did say just to correct, I said born to move earlier. And of course it's, it's built oh. to move. So I, I did want to correct that. All good. All good. Yeah. The whole prevention proactive approach is something that I think all of us here yeah. <laughs> really yeah. want to you know, get the message out and encourage people to do even like, you know, with relationships. That's what I was going to say. I was yeah, like, yeah, I was yeah. like, therapy. don't go to therapy after it's already like, a, right? exactly. like yeah. go in advance, yeah. you know, yeah. it's like go in advance. I mean, you know, it's interesting because I'm not religious and I'm not Catholic, but I actually um, went with some friends of mine who had a, one was Catholic, one wasn't, and they had to do all the like Catholic classes before their yeah. marriage. Yes. And, you know, again, it was a little religious -y for me and not for me, yeah. but, um, but I, what I thought was so interesting is I was like, man, at least there's like an, an institution out there mm -hmm. that actually is making people take a pause in their relationship and actually ask some of those big fundamental questions, which do come up in marriage. You know, how do you view money and how do you want to spend money and save money and how do you want to raise kids? And, you know, I do think we should be doing a lot. Of, and that's back to that intentionality we were talking about before. Right. I think, I think, man, like if we could have more of that kind of thing in whatever context, whether it's in, in a church or in a community or in therapy before your relationship's broken, you name it, you know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's great to actually get those things on the table beforehand. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, that would be the goal is for <laughs> everyone to proactively, preventatively, you know, treat their bodies, relationships, lives with care. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. In my little PT practice, um, you know, I kind of, when I talk to business coaches and growing my brand, I'm always, they're asking like, who's your, who's your avatar? Um, and I always reflect on the fact that, you know, who I end up getting are the people who have failed with 10 other clinicians. Cause I'm providing something very different and like a real solution. I'm not just saying, Hey, let's get you out of pain and let's stick some needles in you. It's, it's, you know, and I know you we're, we're always on the same page with all this stuff. Um, that's why we're here. But um, yeah, it's it's frustrating to be like, can I get to them before the 10th 
provider? Can I be the fifth provider? Yeah. Um, you know, or could, could, uh, you know, this uh, avoiding surgery, our dog yeah. sitter, luck, you know, again, like just a personal thing, a uh, personal connection. She was going to have like a seven level fusion of her neck, 10 years of neck pain, chronic pain. Uh, she has Eller Danlos syndrome. So she's hypermobile for anyone not familiar, but yeah. Uh, I was like, why don't you just come in and like, yeah, let's I'll just see what we can see, do, see what we can do. And she had tried everything, as a lot of people say. And, and you know, um, unfortunately, I, have to, I feel like I have to tell this story a lot because I do think it's important we, we again, catch these people in these situations who just don't know better because they've gone to physical therapy and tried it. Um, and again, the joke, I, I, I was on a podcast earlier today, and, and the joke is, it's like saying, I tried McDonald's and all restaurants are just not good. Or, or you know, right. I tried White Castle and burgers just aren't for me. Um, and so, you know, it's not the same as saying you tried physical therapy. So yeah, like no one in 10 years had shown her how to engage her muscles. And the next day she was uh, her neck muscle specifically. And the next day she's like, my neck is sore. Is that okay? And I'm like, yeah, that's your muscles waking up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so she went to the surgeon, uh, who was going to do seven le levels. And he's like, all right, you can keep doing this thing, but we're still going to do one level. He insisted. So she agreed to that, but you know, again, had we done that three months earlier, four months earlier, maybe we could have avoided surgery altogether and, and gotten her out of that um, pain and living better life and all that good stuff. But anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'll just say we're living a parallel life because I mean, we, we don't have a physical therapy clinic anymore, but we do get, um, but we got a lot of those people um, when mm -hmm. we did have one and we get so many emails and it's like, I almost can recognize the email before I read it because it's usually like nine paragraphs long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> from people who are super earnest and have really tried to f get answers and help to their problems and, um, and, you know, just have not been served well by whoever they've seen. And, and exactly. It's like, it's sort of this idea that's like all, you know, all practitioners are created equal. Well, they're not, and everybody has different systems. And, you know, we, um, we were in Munich a few weeks ago, uh, teaching at the um, Perform Better Summit there. And there's a trainer named Don Saladino. Are you guys mm -hmm. familiar with yep. him? He's a New York based guy yep, yep. and he's not a CrossFit guy. Um, but we had a great dinner with him. Super nice guy. And he's, we were talking about CrossFit and he said, well, you know, people come up to me and they're like, what do you think about CrossFit? You know, cause they want to get, they want to get like the, you know, the answer of like, yeah. I hate yeah. CrossFit or I love CrossFit or, mm -hmm. you know, they're looking for something. And, and he's like, he's like, why would you ask me that question? That's like asking me, do I like restaurants? Like, mm -hmm. he's like, there is a vast difference in CrossFit gyms nationwide and mm -hmm. worldwide and some are great and maybe some are less great. And, <laughs> you know, he, he's just like, he's like, I don't even entertain that question because you know, it's, it's so different depending on the location. And so, yeah, I think, um, you know, but people back, back to this thing, I mean, we're, you're seeing those patients and we're getting those emails, um, mm -hmm. because there is, um, you know, something's not working. Right. Um, and, and I am very, you know, especially as a cancer survivor who is all super, I could not be more pro Western medicine and you'll never hear me say a negative thing about it. Um, cause I'm alive, but simultaneously, I think there's something missing. Um, especially when we come to like the more wellness side of medicine. Right. Um, and so I think that's, that's why we're seeing people who just somehow aren't getting the help they need often and yeah. find us as a last resort. So I think our challenge, and if you guys figure it out, is to figure out how do we get those. We're ready, you know, because it's a million dollar idea. You know, how right. do you get those people to care yeah. before they send you the nine paragraph email? Yeah, I mean, my my one of my reflections, and we've talked about this before, and she kind of was, and I don't want to give away the, the the million dollar idea if we ever end up actually doing it. I don't know that we're going to do it anytime soon. You can just say on TM. You can say TM after you yeah, say yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's that, yours. That, you're 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 a lawyer, so that that yeah. holds up. That holds up in court. Um, one of them is is that like she wants to be like a Mister Rogers for yeah. that kind of like relationship. And I, I was going to ask uh, again with Kelly on here before too, but um, of of like. Can we get a Jack LaLanne to be like, this is what you need to do. Stop listening to all this other noise. And yeah. again, it's going back to those vital signs, the basics. Like, that's what he was preaching. He's like, let's do smoothies or whatever. And that's yeah. an easy way to do it. And, and, you know, but he was the one voice. He was the health guy. Right. I mean, now we have, like you said, 15 apps on your phone. You go on TikTok, there's 3 million influencers or whatever. It's like at some point, you, you, yeah, can you be a node? Uh, which is, uh, you know, I love that concept. I want to, you know, figure out how to build on that in some ways myself as well as as just in general but yeah there's definitely a lot of um 
interesting. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you're right. It's like Jack LaLanne. You're just like, well, it's the one guy, right? Like, how easy was it for him? He was the only guy anyone was listening to in the health and fitness space. And if he's like, buy this blender, everybody yeah, did. He had all the right hashtags. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's what he was yeah, doing. I mean, I think that's, you know, we're trying to do that a little bit with Build to Move. And, and I don't want to overstate our ability to have an impact on, you know, what is, again, a complex problem. But we're trying to do that a little bit. We're trying to just say, hey, you know, maybe try these things. Um, and do the ones that work for you and add in a little bit of exercise on the side and just, you know, do, can you move more freely and feel better and, you know, stress less about what you're doing from a health standpoint? I mean, what is interesting is now you can't, um, and challenging because there are so many voices is, you know, we've probably had one too many conversations about like, okay, how are the critics going to take us down here? And mm. where can we expect critics to take us down there? Right. Because there are so many voices. Yeah. Um, and so that's part of the reason why we we made this book so simple. In fact, Kelly and I had the conversation quite a few times. Like, is this too simple? Like, <laughs> are we going to get taken down because it's too simple? Um, but we decided in the end, no. Like, we really want to have a book that's like, man, from basically whatever, whether you're keto guy or, you know, CrossFit person or breathing person or whatever, whatever sort of like little sub fitness tribe you're coming from, we would just want to say like, look, nobody can disagree that you should eat some vegetables. I mean, well, sorry, there are some people who, would, but, um, that was <laughs> a bad example. King, nobody's going to disagree. Carnivore. Yeah. Nobody's going to disagree that you need to sleep and you yeah. need to move your body, which are kind of like, you know, some of the biggest principles, like you need to move your body. You need to do some input on your body. We, we are in the camp that you need to eat a few vegetables every so often. Um, <laughs> But just the most basic things. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of noise out there. Um, but I, I, I will say, I just I go back to feeling like there are starting to be more and more voices like ours and like the people I mentioned earlier who are saying, "Hold on a second, like we've yeah. overcomplicated this, you know." And let's let's go back to the basics. And that's what we're calling base camp. Like we're just saying, "Hey, look, <laughs> like like to me, um, Kelly used to say this. You know, p people used to." Um, want to come in and see Kelly. And, and he was like, did you eat breakfast? And they're yeah. like, no. And he's like, well, then you can't see me. And they're like, well, I want to see you for my knee pain. And Kelly's like, yeah, but you didn't eat breakfast. So mm -hmm. what are we even yeah. talking about here? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so I feel like we're a little bit, Kelly and I are about that, that thing where we're like, look, are you doing these base camp practices as a yeah. human? Yeah. And self -care. then yeah. if you're doing those things, then you can ask me what kind of magnesium you should be taking. Mm -hmm. But don't ask me what kind of magnesium you should be taking until you're sleeping sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so anyway, I digress. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, no, it definitely um, is, is vital to this conversation and the, this whole concept a hundred percent. And yeah, I do have my five pillars of health, health, health that um, <laughs> we're talking about. Sorry. Pregnancy brain. Yeah. Pregnancy brain. <laughs> Um, you guys have a dog in the background. She yeah, is. She is like, to get our come play with me. Yeah, she's like, what is this? This is my time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I think you're, you're, you know, we are. And, and that's the frustrating thing. And again, like, uh, we, we, you know, I, I was in that CrossFit space and Greg Glassman always talked about the best affiliate will rise to the top. The cream will rise to the top, the libertarian kind of model there. And unfortunately that's been very slow in the fitness space because <laughs> there's just so many people and it takes, X amount of people getting hurt, trying whatever system. I'm not going to pick on any particular system, um, but, you know, trying this system and it not working and then actually them doing worse. And, uh, you know, we've seen some of that stuff. Unfortunately, I'm sure you can throw out a few names if you, <laughs> if you wanted to, but uh, yeah, that, and, and yeah, that cream rising to the top. It's interesting. Again, is knees over toes like going to fix everyone? No, but like it seems right. to be helping a lot of people. So uh, same thing as CrossFit is, is CrossFit uh, going to fix everyone? No, it's not. You know, again, we, what's the saying is it's, it's for everyone, but it's not necessarily, or it's, it should be for everyone. And like, everyone should right, be but in it's there. Actually not, be grandma, right. But it's not because yeah, it's not the, you know, F45 might be a better fit for you. Or, you know, you're not, you don't have to do barbell lifts and, yeah. and Olympic weightlifting and you might get too bulky and that's, that's, you know, something you want to deal with. So yeah, I do think again, we can certainly, we're, we're, we're digressing into all sorts of fun, uh, unfortunate territory here but <laughs> um i do want to be respectful of your time as well and um yeah no i appreciate you guys being on here uh, i'm excited for the book for sure um yeah we're really excited yeah, yeah. congratulations thank yeah. you i'm excited for you guys to have a baby <laughs> <laughs> thank you, you when's it actually our, due when's it November, due november 8th okay. 
is the due date, but you know how these things go. It's not going to only five percent of due dates are accurate. accurate. Yeah, the thing I remember, the statistic that burned into my mind was that white women are on average seven days after their due date. Huh. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was as a white woman that burned <laughs> into my psyche. I was like, okay, okay. And I mean, that, you know, one of my kids was like 10 days late and, and then yeah. one was six weeks early. So you just never know. Oh, you never wow. know what yeah. you're going to get. Wow. Exactly. That's yeah. Yeah. part of the journey is yeah. not knowing yeah. and not being able to control yeah. many things. Yeah, well, it's good you guys know that. Are you guys ready? Are you ready for the baby? Um, You didn't ask for, you guys didn't ask for my advice, but it's good that you have that. I'm going to give it to you anyway. Um, I'm going to give it to you anyway. And, and because I will say I was a much more judgy pre-parent. I would see other parents and be like, Mm -hmm. I'm never doing that. And mm-hmm. 100%, 100% like I'm never going to like, I would see people with yeah. their kids and I would totally judge them and be like, I'm never doing that. And then like, shame on me because 100% of the things I said, I would never do as a parent, you know, mm-hmm. like I was like, my child will not watch television until some age or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then there was like mm-hmm. a day where I was like, dude, I'm home alone and I need to take a shower. Yeah. And yeah. you know, like, like you just reach these moments. So I did all, all of the things I judged people for doing as a parent, I did 100% of them so that's a regret i have um so i appreciate hearing that you guys are like it's it's wide open how this is all gonna go because i think wait do you regret judging them or do you regret doing (laughs) the things no i regret (laughs) judging i regret prejudging them i was i was a judgy meanie about a few things and i don't it wasn't it wasn't a good look and it was a waste it was a waste of my emotional energy being judgy when for sure you know in the end yeah i don't regret doing the things because of course once you do them you're like oh yeah of course i'm doing this yeah that's why a lot of parents do that yeah 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 you're like oh now it makes sense so so anyway i mean you guys are about to um you know i will say i don't in my own observation um actually not everybody loves being a parent but you can never say that out loud after you have a kid (laughs) because you're already in it um but man kelly and i really have had you know, obviously it's, there are many challenges and whatever, but it is so fun to have kids and each phase is special and different and awesome. And you guys are, I'm so psyched for you. So fun. We're very excited too. I'm most excited about the baby phase. Once they get older, I'm like, eh. Oh yeah. See, Kelly and I are like the exact opposite. Cause we, we always tell everyone like we would have six kids if they came out when they were three years old. Really? Yeah, yeah, that we would because like we love kids, but like we're like eh, we're kind of like newborns, whatever. Like, well, we'll send them to you then when yeah, yeah you age. guys just birth them and get them to three, and then send them to us because we're like all go. about that. Yeah. We're all about I, that. I think I'm more in your camp, so I think we'll have that good balance. Yeah. You'll do all the work for the first two, yeah. three years, okay. and then I'll yeah, and give you. I mean, give yourself a break too. There's so much pressure on parents. Like, like literally, I you know used to be like, wow, I shouldn't say that out loud that like newborns are blah, and of course you will. Like, it's <laughs> everything is different with your own child and of course you'll have this deep connection and deep love but like i'm just shameless i'm like yeah i'm not that into newborns like i didn't enjoy that phase that much it wasn't that fun and that does not mean i don't adore my children with everything every part of my being you know you can have many feelings at the same time and it doesn't mean that you know one denies the other it's like it's like the marriage you're talking about ebbs and flows ebbs and flows but overall it's you guys are in for a wild ride and a fun wild ride. Try to stay in the in the raft yeah. as yep. we're on the. No, you weren't. You are going to fall out. You're going to fall out of the raft for sure. A <laughs> lot of times. A lot of times. As long as you're trying to get back into the raft. Exactly. Don't, exactly. Don't just let the river take you wherever. No. Nope. No. 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 I mean, you kind of no. have to surrender at some point and just. Yeah. You know. Just float on down. Yeah, exactly. Float on down. Yeah. In fact, the great. I, I'm, okay, I'm not done giving advice, and then we can end this podcast. So you can just. You can just cut we'll this as off. Much as, you can no, just no. cut this part of the podcast off at the end. But we'll um, whatever you got. We have this great friend TJ who owns a CrossFit TJ's gym here in Marin, and he gave me. Well, he told me one of the great. Well, there's two pieces of advice in this. Um, and I've noticed that he said, you know, being a being a parent is kind of like running a marathon. Like when you send your kid off to college, like you've crossed the finish line and you finished the marathon. But he said, but he notices that a lot of parents kind of stop running at like mile 24 because <laughs> by that point, your kid's pretty self-sufficient. They can mm. drive. And he said, he said that that's actually like the wrong time to take your foot off the gas because, you know, babies, you know. Um, as a working mom, I'm going to say this, like, don't really necessarily need their mom. They need to be held and loved and fed and nurtured. And whether that's from their mom or someone in their community, like that's all great. But babies and little kids rarely can make a decision that can alter their life for the worse. Mm -hmm. Um, teenagers can. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, 
that actually really helped me too, as a working mom and actually in setting up my life that, that actually, it, you know, I actually was like, I'm going to be working a lot when my kids are little because childcare is a real thing. And my kids are going to still have plenty of time to be loved and nurtured by me, you know, outside of my work day. Um, but I have really tried to s set up my life. So now when my kids are teenagers and they can really get into real trouble and have real <laughs> challenges, like yeah. I'm around, yeah, I yeah, am home and around. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, that's, that's great advice. I'm marathon great perspective. Yeah. 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 Marathon. But that's why it's a marathon. When teenagers, I'll send them to you. So. Yeah. That's fine. Just send them to us. I love, I actually love, I love teenagers. Um, I think they're hilarious and awesome. So anyway, um, it's so fun to talk to you guys. You too, Jay. Um, you, yeah. Um, and uh, we, I did want to. That would have that would have led to stand up kids, but we can talk about that another time. That's fine. And as you know, Kelly's parents live in Evergreen, and we have a lot of you know. Since I grew up in Boulder, we have a lot of occasion to make it out that way. So, um, well, so I meet the baby soon. Yeah, I mean, I'm bye sure bye in bye. in the next six to nine months we will be in that area, and let's um, we'll buy you guys a coffee or whatever, oh, whatever it is you partake great. in. <laughs> Any and all of it. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again so yeah. much. Um, we wish you a good night. We uh, wish you a good night. Thank you guys again so much for having us. And thank you on Kelly's behalf. Enjoy doing thank you. the magnesium tonight. <laughs> yeah. And getting in bed by nine. You guys are going to think of us and be like, wow, they're so sad and old. No, no we're actually, no, I'm we're like, I'm like validated actually. We, yeah. Like, oh my god, we're, sleeping, going to bed early is like one of the best things in the oh, world. Oh, it's like, so yeah. good. It feels so good. Yeah, we're it's totally the best. on the same page. Even like if even if we're like Netflixing at nine, we're like, this isn't worth it. Let's just go to bed. Yeah, like, it's what like, are it's we, bedtime. I don't oh. sleep is better. Like we can even it's watch a little something in bed, but yeah, definitely. All right. Well, we're gonna sign off. Um, appreciate you. You can stay on for a second we can uh wrap up.